Well, so first of all, a pleasure to be here and great to be speaking to the audience and indeed the Canadians as well, because Canada's, Canada's got a special role in AI and deep learning in particular, which many of you will know with the, the likes of Jeffrey Hinton, et cetera, and Russia Benjo, Ron McKen, et cetera. Now, what we're looking at here is how AI, and, and here I'm, I'm, I'm using that as an umbrella term to cover machine learning and deep learning and other areas, is really going to disrupt every sector of this economy, of our economy globally, over the decade, over the 2020s, this decade. And we can see whether it's healthcare and getting into text analytics, like a drug discovery, you know, as medical records get more and more digitized, ele electronic, the ability to text mining, but also the ability to link that into the drug discovery stage and get into personalized medicine, computer image, medical imaging rather. And indeed, all the way across to the other side where we've got marketing. In many ways, for all the not notable work of Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun, et cetera, the reality is all the work they're doing is really translating heavily into marketing right now in terms of Google, Facebook being some of the most, and indeed Amazon, ByteDancer and TikTok being some of the most phenomenal and aggressive marketing platforms we've ever seen. And there we're getting to a point where we can really hyper-personalize at scale the, the content and indeed uh, targeted offerings. We're in the early stages of transportation. Um, whilst level five autonomy in vehicles is still a bit of an aspiration, we are seeing uh, continuous incremental improvements there, especially with things like drones and indeed, as we're seeing with space, et cetera, where autonomy is essential. You have to do everything on the edge autonomously. You can't be sitting here on planet Earth if you're sending something into outer space to then uh, you know, maneuver it around real time. The, the vehicle has to, um, um, operate autonomously and understand its environment. Industry, security, et cetera. Um, again, industry 4.0 and all the big data that's being generated. Security is an area where there's a huge shortage of cybersecurity staff, over 3.5 million projected currently. And um, big data is really having a big a velocity, et cetera, is having a big impact there. And as we go into the era of 5G and IoT, cybersecurity with machine learning or deep learning is going to be more and more essential. To, to kind of like defend our, our systems. FinTech and insurance, we already talked about in my last session with, with Camden. So again, this era that we're going into is the fourth industrial revolution. And AI is really going to be at the heart of it. If we look on the right-hand side, and I think for likes Canada and uh, the US in general, um, you know, right at the forefront of that, Toronto, Montreal, et cetera, where we're, we're going through a situation where places like Manchester, where I originally grew up a long time ago in the UK, which was at the center of the original industrial revolution, number one on the left-hand side. I'm not that old, by the way, I wasn't there when those steam engines were there. Um, <laughs> however, we're now in this era where everything is increasingly digitized and COVID-19, the, the consequence of that tragedy has actually accelerated this shift to digital. As people got more and more customized to using mobile, even the older generation had to do a lot of things uh, online, even if they preferred doing it in the physical world before. So my mother, for example, is now customized to digital banking on her phone. Before she refused to use it, then COVID-19, she had no choice. Uh, healthcare, my, one of my brother, I have two brothers, they're both medics. One of them had to operate his medical practice through, through regulation, virtually, no choice on, on camera. So this is the world we're going into um, increasingly, data-driven, uh, analytics-driven, and interconnected everywhere. Well, let's let's look at the fact that, let's say happy birthday, by, by the way, to the term AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> it was like a few days ago, but last week, 31st of August, 1956, John McCarthy, the Dartmouth College, at the, the conference that was held there, when AI or artificial intelligence emerged as an academic research, a field of academic research. So it's actually been around for quite a while, as we can see from the 50s. Some would argue, philosophically have been there longer, but we won't go into that right now. However, it's really been the last decade, if we look at this uh, infographic from, from uh, NVIDIA, that has really taken off. And in particular, with the advent of deep neural networks over the last 15 years, where, of course, uh, Canadian researchers, have, or Canada-based researchers, I should say, have had a big impact uh, from Toronto and Montreal, et cetera, and elsewhere. And what's really driving this state it isn't just the algorithms, but the fact that um, social media, the rise of the internet, uh, mobile phones, these things um, have led to an explosion in data, which we'll look at in a moment, but also graphical processing units have allowed for um, 
you know, efficient processing of uh, large data sets at scale, and indeed, um, and indeed, cheaper storage in the, in the form of cloud, cloud computing, for instance. Going forward, state, and this session is going to be talking a lot about going forwards and looking into the future and where we're going with AI and product development. We're going more and more into the world of hybrid cloud edge and indeed edge computing overall, where increasingly um, AI is going to be sitting on our devices, on, on sensors or around us, on our mobile, etc., and not just on a remote cloud server on the, uh, on, on the cloud. The cloud will still be there. We'll sometimes train our models on the cloud, the hybrid model, but inference on the edge. But increasingly, we, we want to go even beyond inferencing on the edge, which is going to lead to an area of broad AI, which is in between narrow AI that we have today and AGI, which is more an aspiration for the future. I don't think we're going to go from narrow AI to AGI uh, magically overnight. It's a long way to get to AGI. We'll look at that in a moment. But we are going to go incrementally more and more towards something called broad AI, which sits somewhere in the middle uh, before we ever get to AGI in the future. And that's going to be necessary as we go forwards. I mean, I've given my, my uh, um, uh, kudos to these chaps so we can move forward. Congratulations to Work at Canada and the Canadian researchers. However, <clears throat> when we look at AI or intelligent automation market, we sometimes get carried away. And people are going, well, if AI is so powerful and such an amazing technology, why is it not really taking over the world as such in, in the sense of being in every sector of the economy everywhere? Well, let's not forget this um, uh, graphic infographic I really like from KPMG. Back in 2018, when AI hype was at its peak, arguably, when people were getting perhaps a bit carried away with uh, AGI and super uh, intelligence, which any anybody in AI research will know is a long, long way away, if ever. Um, but look, I, I believe we will get there, but it could be decades away. But look, 2021, where we are now, it was projected to be about $41.3 billion. You could argue the numbers are bigger. But the important thing is the quantum, the scale, and the, the acceleration. And you can see a rapid acceleration as we go 22 to 25. And I strongly believe in that because we're going to see the scaling of dedicated 5G networks that are going to, in turn, enable the IoT, the Internet of Things, and edge computing to grow at scale. And we'll come into why that's important in a moment. So wherever AI goes, we create a digital... Sorry, wherever digital goes, rather, we create a digital footprint. And let's not forget data. Data is a key thing. We hear it time and time again, but anyone who works in data science knows <laughs> it all starts with the data, right? And 70 to 80% of our time is spent with the data and a lot less on the exciting part of the algorithms. So COVID-19, accelerate digital transformation, digital growing everywhere. And that means where digital goes, as it expands its footprint, more and more AI will follow. And that's one of the big reasons why I don't believe we're on the verge of another AI winter. Some academics and researchers say, hey, we didn't hit AGI. Uh, uh, we didn't get level five autonomous cars as Elon Musk promised in 2020. We're gonna hit an AI winter. I really believe that's nonsense. We, if anything, the demand for AI in particular machine learning and deep learning over this decade is gonna grow exponentially as we enter this world of interconnected machine to machine communications. So as we know, it's all about data because otherwise we get garbage in, garbage out. So as Gartner noted, uh, three, three key points back in 2018 as to why approximately 87 to 92%, depending on who you believe. But think about that for a moment, that number, 87% to 92% machine learning projects and data science projects fail, fail to deliver ROI, return on investment, make it to production. That's a huge number. But we are still, in all honesty, an industry in its infancy, relatively speaking. We're still actually maturing and growing. We're still trying to figure out a way about what the best techniques are and to, to get the right talent into places. More importantly, it's about understanding the objectives. Yes, data really matters, having it there, and quality data, having the right talent in the team, ensuring you've got somebody in the team who's got the seniority and brought a project to, to delivery before, combined with the diversity, et cetera, across the team. But fundamentally, the number one reason why Gartner found that machine learning projects were failing was they didn't uh, solve the right problem. So the data science teams could, could have done everything technically correct, but the business team and the data science team talk a different language. They don't understand each other. And that means that uh, the solution that is developed is not right for the business. It doesn't solve a customer problem. It doesn't add value. And that's not the fault of the data science team, but equally the business team don't understand data science. 
<laughs> and I said, many of the data scientists I work with have a lot of frustration. They go, no, I showed them a confusion matrix. I showed them their statistical output, et cetera. Uh, you know, I charted the losses out for them. I'm saying, guys, or oh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you can't go to a chief marketing officer or, or you know, a CEO or whatever in the majority of cases, or even a head of digital. So here's a confusion matrix. Here's a chart of losses. Those are the things that are important to us as data scientists. But for the, for the business team, you need to understand what uh, images and charts, et cetera, and show them how you're solving their problems, how you can get better customer engagement, or if it's a cost reduction problem, how we can solve things in the supply chain, et cetera, or the manufacturing facilities, whatever it may be we're looking at. So communication is something that we as data scientists need to, to ensure we can do better and try and understand the business side better to engage with them. Equally, the business side need to stop thinking that AI is an out of the box magic trick. You know, we're going to pull a rabbit out of the hat out of nowhere or we're creating Skynet out of nothing and it's going to come and magically transform their business. That a team of a handful of data scientists are going to replicate Google, <laughs> Google brain in their company. So I think it's really about communication on both sides of the, the coin. But this is going to be fundamental going forwards. And I believe that many CEOs are going to take ownership of the data science and machine learning initiatives in the companies going forwards over the next couple of years. So we'll just touch very briefly on the types of machine learning. So I won't spend too long on this because many of you will already know, but in case there are one or two people relatively new, I mean, I haven't put reinforcement learning on here, so don't get excited, those of you who work with it, and say, where is it? It's coming up. But the majority of um, AI and machine learning that we do is supervised learning, and we're using labeled data sets. And that actually is one of our challenges because getting those labeled data sets can be a challenge in times in, 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 in areas outside of social media, et cetera. Because actually, there was a slide I think you may have jumped over, maybe I missed it somewhere, which shows where the data has been generated. And actually, what we have seen is that the majority of data that's been generated is in e-commerce and social media. And it's no accident that these are some of the most advanced AI teams. They've got the big data sets, very strong engineering teams. Many of them have quite made aggressive acquisitions of AI startups from Canada, the UK, the US elsewhere, et cetera, in, the, in 2016, 2017, 2018. So they've got a lot of in-house capability. But when we come to other areas like healthcare, like um, transportation has been a big challenge. There have been a lot of initiatives to create giant data sets as a ton a cars driving around, autonomous cars filming things, et cetera. So, but, and finance, et cetera. Um, so other sectors of the economy, as we go beyond, um, beyond social media and e-commerce, is getting those labeled data sets and at scale in a way that deep learning algorithms can really um, you know, um, march forward, if you like. The other area in supervised learning is where we're, we're discovering patterns in the data, where the data is not labeled. And that, that is often seen as a bit of a holy grail for uh, AI and, and research world. Because when you think of a baby, human baby or a human infant, a toddler, for instance, they don't need to learn from 100,000 or 200,000 labeled examples in a way that a deep learning algorithm may need to do. They can figure out what's an apple or an orange from a few examples, right? So that's where we want to get to in the future. And there's a lot of research going on in that space. And semi-supervised is somewhere in between where only a small fraction of the data is labeled. So here we go. This is a slide I actually meant to refer to. Um, we can see where the data is getting generated. This is from last year. It's huge, right? Huge amount there. And look, most of it's occurring in the space of social media and in um, e-commerce. And it, but. And so they have very powerful deep learning algorithms and they've got very large data, um, data sets. But there's a challenge there when we try to come to the wider world. And I, I, I joined one of Camdia's events that Adam was hosting a really good event on autonomous driving uh, a month or two ago. But I think when you come to areas like autonomous driving, likewise finance and healthcare, and sorry for the typo down healthcare, um, we have challenges when we come to the real world, as I call it. Because in social media and in e-commerce, if you make a mistake on your deep learning algorithm, you give an incorrect recommendation. Somebody's looking for a sweatshirt and you recommend um, Adam's white shirt instead. Nobody's dead, nobody's injured, no uh, huge financial losses occurred. It's a bad customer experience, it's an embarrassment, but you know what, there's no material damage. Edge cases don't cause huge problems. With an autonomous car, if it turns left instead of right and crashes, someone dies. 
with a uh, healthcare with medical imaging that says it's not cancer it turns out it was cancer the misclassification could lead to someone's death um with, with finance a trading algorithm uh goes and makes the wrong executions triggers a collapse of the company um so explainability interpretability causal reasoning etc are really important when we come to the real world and that i believe is the next challenge for ai and ai research over the next few years as we look to scale into areas like healthcare like finance uh insurance and indeed um autonomous driving now of course there have been a lot of inroads being made in healthcare and in uh finance with ai but really to get to the best algorithm the, the, the very powerful algorithms deep learning deep reinforcement learning etc we really need to get um more more headway in terms of for solving for causality causal inference and um explainability these are key key things and indeed learning from smaller sets of data because unfortunately in areas like healthcare and indeed finance a lot of the data is siloed and there's a reluctance to collaborate because there's strict privacy regulations or GDPR in the EU and UK um the US is HIPAA Canada has its own privacy regulations and it's understandable because they they're to protect the patient or customers the banks but this is where we'll look at things like federated learning and differential privacy etc going forwards and also finding ways to compress algorithms and make them more efficient going forwards especially as they go on the edge and learn from smaller data sets so one of the big things here that i wanted to stress was v of value when we look at the big v's of big data it's so often overlooked by us on the data science side because we get we're thinking a lot on the technicalities but increasingly as we're working on problems inside companies etc and sectors we need more and more to communicate the importance of extracting value from our data sets and that's coming from right at the beginning when we're creating the data ingestion side all the way through to algorithm implementation <clears throat> so really we've got to think of value from an end to end perspective so that we don't go all the way through and then find out after 6 months to a year of work and bringing something to production <laughs> we fall out on the business side and they say well this isn't doing anything for me and and you know um so i mean this is one of the important things we need to start considering going forwards so just throwing that out there so one of the big differences though between the legacy firms non tech firms if you like is that they need to really think like a google or i should say alphabet its parent company and amazon a a facebook well okay there's certain things facebook did that maybe like you know we might not agree with but um but basically what i mean by that is the mentality of viewing technology not as alien territory not something that is just a cost base when you talk to legacy banks legacy retailers etc legacy insurance companies healthcare providers hospitals they view technology including data science and data ingestion systems as costs pure costs when you go to a, a, a google or an amazon they view technology right from the outset as a potential revenue generator and they're thinking about the customer experience all the way through from the outset so one of our challenges actually on the business side is for the business teams at the c level in companies whether it be in canada the us uk european union wherever japan wherever to in the legacy side if they want to survive at the end of this decade and many of them will not to be very honest with you many will disappear um because the 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 rate of change we're about to go through this decade especially as 5g networks standalone networks not not those piggybacking on 4g which is most of what's happening right now but standalone networks emerge over the next few years we're going to go through more rapid change than we ever have perhaps over the last 2 to 300 years perhaps ever in human history in the space of this decade so increasingly companies it doesn't matter if they got a 100 year old legacy they can disappear like that as we're seeing with some of the big retailers in the UK and US that 100 Sears uh, British Home Stores 100 year 150 year uh, brand identities gone in a heartbeat so it won't count for anything unless you're relevant and you're giving a good customer experience and that means that the legacy firms have to actually view <clears throat> data science and machine learning as ways to generate value in ROI return on investment but deeply integrated into the company as a core part of the company and not just a cost thing and not just hey you know we put it as a ticking exercise because that's not going to do anything
diversity too, as we saw, even with the big tech majors, <laughs> if you don't have the right diversity, because if you think about it, you're making solutions for your customer base and your customer base is diverse. They're not homog homogeneous as one type, you know, it's not Adam as all your customers as me, all your customers, it, different types of people in your customer base. So when, for example, Google and Microsoft made those uh, computer image um, <coughs> uh, algorithms, which misclassified Asian and black people as gorillas, <laughs> not a very good thing. Or when they, they struggle with female faces, now they, they then went and looked at the data set and thought, we're massively underrepresented in the data set and women and black and Asian people. Hey, if you had diversity in your data science team, there were, somebody would have put their hand up and gone, hey, hang on, I think we've got a problem here. So really um, trying to inject, put that engender that through right from the outset. I'll just say very quickly, overfitting, underfitting, appropriate fitting. You'd be surprised how many young data scientists still do this. It really annoys me <laughs> how many that I work with. And they'll come to me and go, oh, yeah, we're getting 98, 99% accuracy. And I say, what, what, what is that on the outer sample? And they go, what do you mean? I mean, on the, on, the, on the training set. And I'm like, right, that's great. But, you know, well done. But it needs to work out of sample, right? We need to see how it performs on the unseen data. And I know many of you already know that. But if you don't, please remember that. Because, yeah, you can get great results in your training model. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate well in the real world. So train and test, always test. And don't fall in love with your train set. I see many young data scientists go, I got 99%. I don't want to test it now. <laughs> no, no, you have to test it. Otherwise, it's unsafe. The other thing I'll say very briefly, the bits in red. Again, I get a bit surprised. Sometimes I know many of you already know this. But the confusion between parameters and hyperparameters. And remember, model parameters are something that are usually estimated or learned from the data. It's something inherent within the model itself. It's not something that we, as practitioners, are usually touching. Um, whereas hyperparameters, these are the things we're usually tuning as practitioners. So when we're working with the machine, we're usually, and the model setup, we're focused on getting hyperparameters. And we're, we're working in an objective function, which is either usually trying to minimize or maximize something. We're either trying to maximize the accuracy by tuning the hyperparameters, or we're trying to minimize the losses, again, by tuning the hyperparameters. But the parameters, that are, and that could be, for example, if you're in a deep neural network, how many layers you have, how many neurons you have, of course, with a boosting model, the, the, the leaves, et cetera, the layers, and uh, your learning rates. But the models, the parameters, sorry, the parameters of the model, that is not that is something the, the model has learned itself inherently within the model. So supervised learning, this is a nice one from Booz Allen, which shows the types, which is classification and regression. Classification will know, is this a dog or a cat? Is it an apple or is it a, a orange? And indeed regression, when we're trying to learn from historical data and then forecast that forwards for continuous variables, something, um, for, for example, house prices, stock prices, so on and so forth. You see, I love seeing is believing. And I think when we can see something in action, it's a shame actually I wasn't able to show my screen because I was going to start with a video showing it, the vision of the future uh, on a video because seeing is always much more powerful, but we'll try to convey that message anyway. And I, and I think this one from Moody's, many of you all know Moody's, one of the, the, the big two in credit rating. And here we see the power of a machine learning with a random forest using supervised learning. And what you see, focus on these three images, the actual data on the left. And then you see some people asking, what's the difference with you know, using traditional statistics? Well, here we've got a, a linear stati traditional statistical model. And look how badly it's fitting the data, because the red shows the defaults, and the black is the good data. So, And then look at the one on the right with the random forest prediction, and then compare that on the left. So what did S&P conclude? A machine learning model unconstrained by some of the assumptions of classical statistical models can yield much better insights than a human analyst could infer from the data alone, which is alone at the end. So we can go, we can automate these things and outperform traditional statistical models. With, uh, but we need labeled data, and that can be the challenge at times. Unsupervised learning, we're often looking at things like clustering and anomaly detection. And um, as I said, it's often seen as a bit of a holy grail in, in um, uh, AI research because we want to get to this world where instead of 
feeding an algorithm 100,000 label data sets or 20,000, whatever it may be, but in particular, transfer learning helps there. We'll come into transfer le learning later. But we're still using large, large num uh, uh, numbers of examples. Whereas, as I said, with a human toddler, with a young child, you can probably teach them what is an apple with a few examples, five or six examples, and what is an orange. And they'll learn themselves that a an apple could be red or green. <laughs> All right. uh, so, whereas a machine has to be taught a lot of these things from very large label data sets. The next two slides give this example. Seeing is believing is always a good example. And here we have a retailer, and you see the customer segments and um, the, the income, uh, the levels of income. And what we can see is that actually on our, our green, our dark green on the left, we have the lowest income group, and yet there's some of the biggest spenders in our store. So this is spend per store and, uh, and, and income, income segment. So the lower income segment on the left is also some of our biggest spenders. But if you were trying to do a targeted uh, marketing campaign on them or drilling deeper and really personalized offerings, you've got a very wide dispersion and you might be finding you've got groups of very different um, you know, behaviors. Now, using um, uh, uh, six clusters that the, the algorithm's gone to it, so, uh, we tell it to go to, to the next level with the elbow method. There's an information gain. And now we can see in that, dark, that green on the left has become light blue and, and dark blue or turquoise and, and, and dark blue. So now we can actually drill into that group on the far top left quadrant and really do targeted marketing for them. We, the blue on the right is also split between a green and a yellow. So again, you've got um, scope there to do some uh, targeting for them there. And that's just giving you a, an example of how that's useful. And again, you know, the, these techniques also get used for fraud detection, uh, on anomalies and, and, and uh, malware detection, et cetera. But this is just a good example to show you in a simple way. For those of you who are excited about reinforcement learning and maybe getting upset with me going, hey, he's talked about supervised and unsupervised learning and semi-supervised. What about reinforcement learning, which is right on the cutting edge of a lot of things going on, especially in the R&D side? Well, here you go. So this is goal-orientated algorithms. And, it, and I think many people come outside of AI and data science get very confused because they often say to me, isn't reinforcement learning unsupervised? And you have to explain to them, well, and it's hard to explain to them, <laughs> but it is kind of philosophically similar in a way, except we're using a reward-based system rather than um, yeah, looking at statistics or statistical patterns. So an agent that is trying to behave in, in such a manner uh, or seeking to optimize the rewards it gets for taking the right decision and gets penalized for taking wrong decisions. And again, when this area in particular, when it's been combined with deep learning, deep reinforcement learning as uh, DeepMind who were acquired by Google back in 2013, 2014, have really pioneered a lot of this field. Uh, and we'll look at some very exciting algorithms that are going on here in recent research. We're gonna go through this very quickly because many of you already know, Andrew Eng, so deep learning. And I used to put this slide out a lot going, hey, look, I'm a deep learning practitioner and we beat the other algorithms. I know that isn't always fair though, because you know, your XGBoost and your light GBMs and your cat boosts can do very well with structured data and sometimes even beat the deep learning algorithms. So I think we I just wanted to put that caveat there. So if any of you come from XGBoost or like GBM, et cetera, you don't get too upset. But where deep learning is having a lot of um advances though over the last 10 years has been computer vision and text and text over the last few years as transformers have come up and we'll look at those more clo closely. So when we think of the human brain and, you know, um, when we go back to, to um, John McCarthy and he was creating AI as an academic field with Marvin Minsky and those others at Dartmouth College in 1956, in the summer of 56, they were talking about AI, uh, that slide was a bit corrupted, so I'll just recap though. It was saying that AI is defined as, you know, computer, computing systems that mimic or you know, learn to act like humans in a way. So doing things, tasks that humans are good at, for example, recognizing images, for example, understanding uh, uh, speech and text. So when we think of those very human things, yes, uh, going back a step, XGBoost and like GBM work very well with structured data, but they're not gonna work very well with computer vision or NLP. So here we're going into deep learning. And this is where a lot of the advances come over the last five to 10 years, in some cases leading to sensationalist reports in, in, in the media and through marketing, people saying, hey, and, uh, hey, AI is about to take over the world and AGI is here when we know it's not. But this is the very a very exciting area. So I think many of you already know CNN architecture, I won't say too much, but you've got the input image, it gets, you know, uh, uh, we have convolutions going on, then 
which kind of like go in these small squares going across the pixels to then um, identify, uh, abstract, if you like, from um, the, the extract patterns from the input data in a hierarchical manner, and then find the spatial images or relationships in those images rather. And, it, and you can see the image keeps going smaller and smaller until you get to the far right. And then uh, it goes through um, uh, flattening it and then for a softmax uh, for a prob probabilistic um, um, distribution in terms of what the, the image actually represents. And um, as you know, with back propagation, we keep on going backwards and forwards until we get to, as I say, the objective function is maximized or minimized, whichever way we're going, maximize highest accuracy, minimize lowest losses. And then <clears throat> we, we want to say, are we getting to network convergence where we can't improve that anymore? And so we're now correctly recognizing car as a car, truck as a truck in this example. So this has been really at the forefront of the advances in computer vision, except over the last year where and more exciting things have also been coming with transformers and we'll look at those. GANs create a huge amount of excitement and, and perhaps confusion because of deep fakes, et cetera. Many of you already know GANs, two competing neural networks here. We might could be looking at two CNNs, albeit we'll look at an example of a transformer as well. Um, you can think of it as two neural networks that are competing, like a, a min-max game and a zero-sum game, where you've got an expert and a fraudster, and the fraudster keeps on uh, making better and better images until it can fool the expert. So you've got two neural networks, the expert uh, that kn knows what the actual image, the genuine image looks like, and it keeps on getting criticism, if you like, until the, 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 um, the fraudster, the second neural network, I'm saying fraudster for a way of visualizing it, um, can actually create something that fools the expert. And um, this has had amazing results for synthetic data and things like images with StyleGAN2. I played around a lot with StyleGAN2. And we tried to make, um, uh, see if it was possible to make realistic films with it in a way that many feared the US presidential election would go. And in actual fact, it's not quite there for that, that area yet because it's unsupervised. You can't really control it. So you don't really know what it's going to do image to image. And it's actually very hard to fake the, the lips. Sorry, I realize I'm a bit dark here. So I may try and switch light on in a moment. But you, it's very hard to see the lips as you, as you it, it, to, to rather mimic the lips as you put someone else's voice into it with the GANs. So it's not quite there yet in, 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 in the way that people were fearing that you can make fake political things um, in a year or two, a couple of years, maybe, who knows? It's having a lot of uh, in potential impact in areas like drug discovery, although there's a lot of debate whether or not the synthetic generation of data is good enough or not to, to be realistic for, for, for uh, drug discovery and you know, synthetic, uh, synthetic chemistry in terms, of, um, in terms of the molecules being generated. Because we don't know a lot of the molecules that actually exist that they're potential combinations. We only know a small fraction, and we'll look at those in a moment. Here's the art part of StyleGAN2. Uh, I think I've got one. Uh, this might have been one that I, copied, that I actually ran, or, or maybe one I took from somewhere. But anyway, you can see these are all fake people, yet they look real. <laughs> right? So many of you have already played around with guns. They're cool. And then one of our, our challenges, though, is also been trying to understand uh, explainability, including with CNNs, where uh, convolutional neural networks, in terms of how they work for the, the, the ability to say why. If we're telling someone, You've got cancer. This uh, you don't want to say. They go to the doctor. Uh, they're really shocked and they say, "How? Why?" And he or she just shrugs their shoulders. I don't know. The, the AI system told me you got cancer. I don't know. You know, uh, it's the ability to ask those questions. Likewise, if an autonomous vehicle turned left instead of right, you want to know why it did that so that you can correct that in the future. So, getting to model explainability is of great importance when you get into the real world. In particular, as we're moving outside of social media and e-commerce where there are real world consequences. So one of the things that uh, advances over, uh, over the last couple of years ago have been saliency maps. And here you're seeing the example where we get to see what the, um, through the heat map, what the, 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 the CNN was actually looking at in terms of making its determination. Because this is actually, I think here, this is actually a CNN that I ran. It's one of my own models. And we were looking at skin cancer and classifications of skin lesions. And you can see patient number one, it's quite very, you would hope the dermatologist would get that, right? It's very clear to the human eye. But on the right, you can see what the uh, convolutional neural network was looking at. But look at patient number two. That's a lot harder. If you're a dermatologist, you've been working really long hours, likewise radiologists in other areas, 
We've been working very, very long hours, flat out. You know, you're not a machine. You can't run 24-7. Um, long, tiring day, you might miss the classified app quite easily, um, <clears throat> whereas our machine got it. So, and remember, a dermatologist has been to med school five or six years, he or she, and then they've had five or six years training after that often. It takes a lot of time and money to invest to get them up there. And in some places around the world, for example, in much of Africa and parts of Latin America and Asia, there's a severe shortage of such specialists because they don't have the same money as we do in Canada, the US or Europe. And, and often their best people who are trained in these areas might leave to go and work in Canada or the US or London because they get better money. So um, the ability to apply this kind of technology, not to replace dermatologists or radiologists, but augment them and help relieve uh, the shortages, I think is one of the key things there. We actually got 90% accuracy across imbalanced data sets of some classes. It wasn't binary because on binary, it's easy to get 99%, some of you know. So in seven imbalanced classes, it was a bit harder, but we, we did a good job there. The thing is, though, there are those who say, well, silency maps, heat maps, very nice, but still we want more, especially in the real world, what, uh, for example, an autonomous vehicle, we still want deeper questions, not just uh, post hoc in the way that um, the silency map is telling you after the event. But we want to know, as the neural network is learning, why is it making certain decisions and why is it coming to certain outcomes? And there's recent research from a year ago, Chen at ALIA 2020, um, where at Duke University, team of, uh, um, I think Chen was actually an undergrad, so huge kudos to him if I remember correctly, but it came up with a paper with, with other researchers on concept whitening. And it actually showed that um, how, um, as it goes through layer to layer through the convolutional neural network, you could actually track how it was learning with the latent spaces and where there were gray spaces, et cetera, what was activating, what was not activating, but it wouldn't hurt the predictive performance. So I've got, um, look up this paper uh, if you want to um, have a look. In, in terms of how it's working, explainability. But that's just uh, an interesting development that's uh, you know quite a potential game changer for CNNs. But there have been many limitations of CNNs. Now, apart from the apart from the challenge on on um, on uh, explainability, where we're, we're starting to get good headway or making improvements, um, we've seen a situation where adversarial examples uh, can cause problems. So, for example, to the human eye. The image on the left and the one on the far right, we can clearly see it's a pig versus it's a pig. But we can see with minor perturbations added with the noise in the middle, um, the convolutional neural network now thinks that pig is an airliner. Um, so this is the challenge where I was saying in the real world, um, you don't want your autonomous driving car <laughs> to misclassify uh, a, a, a sign on the road or whatever. Uh, a stop sign for a ghost sign, et cetera, that could have huge consequences. Um, and likewise in healthcare, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we've been grappling with dealing. The Picasso problem has also been noted in CNNs that, um, for example, the image on the right versus the left and the right, the CNN could actually think they're the same or classify them as the same because it could, just the lip or the eyes, it could identify that as a face. So Jeffrey, I won't say too much on this, Jeffrey Hinton had, the idea of capsules, it gave various exam, um, um, ideas on that, why, why it'd be an improvement on CNNs. He didn't like max pooling in CNNs and thought that uh, capsules would have a huge advantage. I often get asked about capsules, what's going on. There has been some research I didn't bother showing that because I think Hinton himself has moved on from it. Uh, he's now pushing this idea of GLOM. Um, I've given the link here to the paper, we won't go into detail on that. It's uh, new research that came out earlier this year. And he believes that this is going to be the future of deep neural networks. We'll see if that is the case or if it's going to be, I think transformers are really scaling a lot of areas in the next few years. So we'll focus a bit more on those. So let's just talk again about deep reinforcement learning for a moment. So deep reinforcement learning had a pivotal moment back in 2016, five years ago, when it defeated the world champion in Go. And when you often tell someone, hey, it defeated the world champion in Go, an AI algorithm, I go, yeah, really what's the big deal we've been beating chess champions for a long time except go which is a three thousand year old game it's a lot more complex than chess um deep mind themselves say that the number of uh common configurations on the board is 10 to the power of 170 um 10 to the power of 170 possible board configurations which they claim is more than the number of atoms in the known universe 
So it was a huge big data problem, huge complexity. And yet uh, many thought it was too early for an AI algorithm to be a human world champion in Go, and they did it. So um, AlphaGo was quite a benchmark and it showed um, exciting potential in the field of gaming. But more recently, last year, I mean, New Zero was first published in 2019. And, and then um, more research came on it, um, more publicity, if you like, a year ago in 2020, where um, DeepMind actually showed how Mu Zero could go way beyond AlphaGo. Because AlphaGo still had to learn the, the rules of the game, right? And uh, you can see the, the uh, future variations of AlphaGo that became more and more powerful um, going to AlphaZero, but it still worked on known rules. Mu Zero, the big innovation there, it didn't know the rules didn't know the rules, and yet it destroyed the others. So uh, it's seen as a very exciting benchmark for potential AI applications in the future. Um, I've given the link there, so you can you can go and have a look at that in more detail going forwards. <clears throat> Excel Land uh, uh, came out in July this year. Um, it's, you can see the journalist there, Ben Dixon, asked, is it a step towards AGI? Um, DeepMind claimed, probably not yet, but it's... Uh, not AGI anyway, but it's exciting development. And it showed that in a gaming environment, how its algorithms were actually starting to do zero shot learning uh, themselves um, uh, on various tasks. So go and again, I've given the link there. You can go and um, look up in more detail there. It's just to tell you where the cutting edge research is right now. And then uh, Pondernet, which came out again this summer, and MIT C-Cell there pointing out how um, the uh, DeepMind's algorithm is learning to think for a while before answering like humans. Um, oh, okay, we come to nearest symbolic AI. So another area that's generating, generating a lot of excitement on the research side is neurosymbolic symbolic AI, which has been looking to bring together two schools of AI, which has been um, the um, connectionists, which is deep learning deep neural networks, the ANNs, the artificial neural networks, alongside uh, symbolic logic. And, you know, if I was a psychologist from New York, I won't give a name, I could, one of the things I learned in psychology in business school was anchoring. And I could say DeepMind spent 1.6 billion is what the amount, the amount that uh, Google put into it. And they haven't con conquered AGI yet. So was that money well spent? But then I could turn around and say symbolic logic, which I did study. I had to study that in AI postgraduate level. Um, you know, the market when the second AI winter came, in 87, I believe it was, $1.1 billion was spent by companies around the world, which if you scaled up for money today, adjusting for inflation, et cetera, would be $4.3 billion. And it, we got the AI winter that followed. So the problem with symbolic logic was that it looked at the world as black and white, but there shows a gray in between. So, it, and it didn't really have learning as such, but it was very good at dealing with things like causal reasoning that, um, and logic by its very name, right? Uh, in a way that deep neural networks have sometimes struggled with or perhaps not their strongest points. So IBM Watson MIT lab, uh, which is part of working with C-cell, MIT C-cell, have um, been doing a lot of research. I say a lot of the leading research in this field and uh, bringing these two together. So again, you can look at this article that I've given links to, which are going into more detail on that and how that's uh, combining the two together. In actual fact, during lockdown that we had over the last year, I did a bit of work on neurosymbolic AI with my team. We tried with self-driving cars, but the challenge there was still the data set because you've still got neural networks underneath. And if you're trying to get, yeah, you've got a lot of large data sets for images, but when you're you need to label the images to explain what's going on in them. Because actually, when we were talking about CNNs, the problem with autonomous driving, when Adam hosted that session before, you can get to pretty decent levels of accuracy on um, computer vision uh, object detection, but it doesn't really understand what it's seeing and the interconnection between the, the images and the way that a human can do, right? Uh, I can understand the relationship between the different objects I'm seeing. And I can even predict that one might be about to crash into the other and take an evasive maneuver. If I see an elephant coming down the road, I mean, I hope I'm not going to, but there's some parts of the world where that happens. And in Canada, for instance, and parts of the US, when you're in the rural areas, you could have a giant grizzly bear or some other a large animal um, coming into, onto the road. And if your CNN is just trained on urban environments, and it's going to say, well, 
yeah, there's a large animal there, but I'll just try and drive around it. <laughs> might not be the best outcome. Whereas a human might go, whoops, reverse. So that's the common sense that we have as humans that a deep neural network in isolation doesn't. But to create these labeled data set, you still have to create the deep labels data sets for the, um, the, 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 the deep learning. We, 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 we tried transformers actually running LSTMs combined with, uh, including for the computer vision side or, or hybrid CNN networks combined with uh, transformers and knowledge graphs for the symbolic logic. Um, but in the end, we've, we've gone and done it actually for finance, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so this is a very exciting area, but it still requires da large data sets, even with, even with um, transfer learning that you can get with transformers that is a lot harder with LSTMs on, 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 on language, et cetera. Um, you still need that, those annotations to really learn from before this kind of thing can really scale. So anyway, those of you who are excited, to, excited about this and want to learn more about it, I recommend going and looking at Clevera, which stands for collision, sorry for the typo there, collision events for video representation and reasoning. And as I say, it was um, MIT, IBM Watson lab uh, that published it. And it showed how the um, machine could actually learn from the video to understand the relationship between objects what was bigger than the other, what was more far away. And even that two were about to collide with each other and you could ask it questions and it could reply to you, uh, showing causal, causal inference and, uh, and, and also having um, a degree of common sense. So that's a very exciting development, but I do think this is gonna take a few more years yet before you can scale through a lot of the other sectors to again, build up those data sets. Uh, I won't talk too much about neuroevolution, but it is another exciting area that kind of made a comeback due to Uber Labs bringing it back into fashion a few years ago. And then it caught the attention of a few people, um, including Intel, for example. And neuroevolution it had been around for a while. It applies to evolutionary algorithms and likes of genetic algorithms, which is part of the evolutionary techniques. And um, for example, uh, NEAT, which is neuroevolution of augmenting topologies rather, it's been around for a while. Ken, Ken Stanley, who argues in Nature in 2019, that this could be one of the candidates for getting to AGI in the future because it gets around uh, some of the limitations that we have with gradient descent and uh, the challenges there in terms of the efficiencies, in terms of working out global maximums and global minimums um, in large spaces. Um, for relatively simple problems, NEAT can uh, sometimes outperform reinforcement learning or other neuroevolutionary approaches. When you get to deep neuroevolution and complex problems, CMAES and PEPG, which have been around for a while, have shown to sometimes perform well. You can have a look at those. And, and again, sorry for the typo there, that should say collaborative evolutionary reinforcement learning cell from Intel. In data science, we love our complicated uh, acronyms. Um, Intel actually had a very good result on um, hybrid learning between reinforcement learning and neuroevolution on um, humanoid, uh, on a humanoid um, uh, walking around. Uh, so have a look at that. That was a good result. I'll say just a word about, a short word about recurrent neural, neural networks and LSTMs. Uh, they're a bit ahead of their time. They came out quite a while ago, 1999, I believe, if memory, no, even 97, I believe. And, um, but the thing is, they had their limitations. We didn't quite get the same revolution in uh, text and speech analytics as we were getting computer vision that CNNs gave us at the end of the last decade. And it's really been the rise of transformers that have take, taken that forwards. So increasingly, certainly with NLP, we're tending to find that the transformers have really taken over rather than the RNNs and the LSTMs. LSTMs still have a role in, in time series forecasting, but there again, hybrid um, LSTM transformer models with self-attention are having a big impact. And I myself am working with tr uh, transformer models for time series forecasting. The rise of the transformers, one of my favorite areas, um, that has been having a huge impact in NLP, natural language processing. As I say, it was a poor relation of computer vision and deep learning until recent years. And now it's a lot of the innovation that's happening in AI and deep learning has been happening in the space of text analytics of uh, speech and text over the last few years as um, transformers have really resulted in a step change in performance. It was brought in by Google in 2017, involves a self-attention mechanism encoders and decoders, masking so that um, in terms of its training and multi-headed attention. Let's have a look at what, what those look like. So this looks like an awfully complicated diagram, but if you look at the, the article I've given, 
it'll explain it really well. So don't get too, too intimidated. Um, they're actually relatively easy to implement. I shouldn't really say this, but Hugging Face um, has provided really good. Uh, it's an open source library. You can get it on GitHub. It's provided a lot of documentation to implement it either with TensorFlow or with PyTorch. And um, models like BERT and many others have had uh, best-in-class performance for the the tech side, and it involve, uh, uh, allows for transfer learning, which is very important because with LSTMs and RNNs, transfer learning was a lot more limited. And in actual fact, one of the reasons why computer vision started to explode with the CNNs was we started to get a lot of collaboration in communities with more and more transfer learning emerging through there. And with transformers, we've seen that develop in the NLP side where you can um, apply transfer learning um, to, to get these models in and actually uh, on a, a relatively smaller data set, uh, but uh, a fi fine tune it to, so for example, for finance, we work together, it's my my previous uh, domain. So we've got a data set hand labeling about uh, five or 6,000 words, and then we're able to um, feed that into BERT. It's a bit more complicated what we did. We did BERT to BERT with knowledge injection uh, in between because we're doing um, neurosymbolic AI as well with it. Uh, knowledge graph somewhere in there. But anyway, the thing is that transfer learning was a game changer there. Because if I had to go and uh, train a, a transformer model from scratch, I've done it before, but it's very computationally expensive. They're huge beasts. So this is one of the exciting fields where it's really scaling a lot due to the fact that relative to LSTMs and RNNs, not only because of its improved performance and accuracy, et cetera, but also the ability to apply transfer learning at scale We'll mention DALA-8 because GPT-3, many of you heard of GPT-3, that's another big transformer model, uh, which captured a lot of attention a year ago from OpenAI because it was uh, writing articles itself, albeit you know, it may have required a bit of hand-holding here and there. Um, however, it was a real uh, game changer for more um, advanced capabilities on the AI side. And DALA-8, which is um, GPT-3 based, can draw pictures based on text inputs and here's this example that was shown around on the media where someone said an armchair in the shape of an avocado, and there you go. And if you think about that, a few years ago, it wasn't doable. So who knows where we'll be two to three years from now. So switch transformer from Google, and then there's an even larger one in China, which I didn't reference, um, which goes to even more parameters. And Google didn't really make as much noise in the media as this one. It's um, seven or eight times the size of GPT-3, if I remember correctly. Um, so, and, and the one in China is even larger. But really, do we need to go bigger and bigger and bigger models? I don't know. Maybe GPT-4 is going to be even more humongous when it comes out later this year, probably. But I think mean, increasingly, we need to find ways to make these models work efficiently, <laughs> but smaller, so that they can scale especially through the sectors of the economy as we scale AI. So I think that's going to be one of the big challenges we go through is neural compression and pruning, which is already growing as an area, but really small is going to become more beautiful. Ways to get compression whilst maintaining performance is where I think the likes of Google and the other tech majors need to put a lot of their focus going forwards. So the thing is, as I mentioned, transformers are, are moving beyond just uh, text, NLP. We've seen computer vision, for example, in October 2020, Google put out the paper. Uh, an image is worth not a thousand words, but 16 by 16 words. And it, it actually showed transformers for image recognition at scale with zero convolutions, zero. And it re achieved state, state of the art performance. Uh, before that, Facebook research had a hybrid one with CNNs and, and, and um, transformers. We'll look at that as well. And we've seen time series, as I mentioned, I myself am working with TFTs. Temporal fusion transformers, which give explainability, that also came from Google and give state of the art performance. And I model renewable energy uh, forecasts on the back of that. Uh, Alpha Star combined a transformer torso with deep reinforcement learning to achieve state of the art performance in gaming. Uh, deep mind of other things like the perceiver. And then Alpha Fold 2, which solved that 50 old mystery of um, um, protein folding, which deep mind have now open sourced, which who knows what kind of uh, drug discoveries that's going to yield going forwards for the, the, the medical community. That's a huge game changer because until we solved, um, until we solved uh, protein folding, we were unable perhaps to solve some of the very complex diseases 
And I recall being in front of a VC a couple of years ago before COVID came, and I was working with drug discovery models. And they told me, until we get to quantum computing, we won't solve uh, protein folding. And until we solve protein folding, we won't be able to solve for things like complex cancer diseases. Well, we, didn't, we haven't got to quantum computing yet, and DeepMind have apparently solved it with their model, and they've open sourced it. So let's see some very exciting things to come out there. And indeed, the ability to create um, enzymes that could eat plastic. Uh, you know, we've got this plastics problem in the seas and in the waters, getting into our fish and other things uh, across the ecosystem. Um, AlphaFold might find solutions for that. If we move forwards, please. So this was the hybrid model that came out from Facebook in 2020, applying combining transformers with convolutional neural networks, a hybrid model, and um, the DETR. Alex, uh, sorry, Adam, if we could jump to the next one. You can see what they said is that it could even handle partially occluded objects, which is a bit, you know, that's important in the real world. If you think of an autonomous car, partially occluded objects and the ability to detect them, except it had a weakness, which it was not very good with small objects, was one of its major negatives. And that is a big challenge in the real world. But Zhu Atalia, in, um, at the end of 2020, I think, or early 21, put out a deformable transformers, a deformable DETR, which had advantages over the Facebook DETR, took the Facebook DETR and further enhanced it. And actually it worked very well with uh, even small objects, including, including, um, the fact that you could actually train with 10 times less uh, training epochs. So it's just something if you're interested in, you can have a look. It was tested on the Coco Benchmark P. So this is what Andre Karpathy, head of AI at uh, Tesla, a famous AI researcher, uh, said about the uh, images worth 16 by 16 words. He was very excited and said, you know, um, um, loving the increased convergence between vision and NLP and more efficient um, architectures. Who knows where we'll be with vision transformers? couple of years from now, still building the community um, and the CNN community perhaps are fighting back a bit. That battle in computer vision is still going to play out over the next one or two years. I know this might sound controversial, but I think the Transformers will win in the end. I just really like the fact that they, they um, you can interpret the models more easily, in my opinion, um, understanding the attention mechanism and how it's working. It's just my own view. Um, we'll see where that goes. Again, GANs. GANs have now been done not with two CNNs, but with two, two, two Transformers. Um, published earlier this year by Jing Lia, that two uh, Transformers can make one strong GAN and it can scale very efficiently. Um, so, <laughs> spike in neural networks, I won't say too much about. This comes into, um, um, this is an idea that, especially as we go into the world of IoT and edge computing, et cetera, and the vast amounts of data we're going to generate, do we have to move beyond the von Neumann architecture? And in particular, with uh, reservoir computing and spike in neural networks, which try to mimic nature a bit more, because, you know, is the von Neumann architecture that we've had for many, many decades, 80 years, really the right architecture in terms of going to more advanced AI in the future? And in particular, if we think that quantum computing commercially, whilst we'll keep on getting breakthroughs throughout this decade, may not become available commercially at scale at the until the 20 around 2030 maybe who knows is it going to be reservoir computing that's going to take up in between um with spike in neural networks anyway it's just something for you to look at and think about transfer learning i think many of you know um it's the, had a huge impact with cnns and now we're seeing with with uh, with um, um transformers and text etc and the fact that we can chop off the head of the the output layer without having to retrain the entire network and put on our own head if you like in the outer layers and with a smaller data set and fine tune it to perform without having to go back through that very costly and expensive uh, computation. And it's viewed by some that transfer learning in the future, enhancing transfer learning in the future might get us closer towards AGI, more generalized artificial intelligence or generalization. It does have a limitation right now that it works better with more closely related examples. So if you're terrified of Skynet, don't worry, it's not going to occur overnight. I think what um, knowledge graphs I'll just say a little bit about because it's it's an area that I find very exciting because we can start to get to graphical representations, bringing in a bit of, you know, loosely speaking, symbolic AI or symbolic logic to actually represent what's going on. And it's got had huge implication potential in both healthcare, healthcare rather than finance. Um, Here you see we've got nodes and edges of relationships, and we can see Putin, whatever you think of him, he's just an example here, it's the president of Russia. 
and Russia is a member of APEC, and Putin also worked at the KGB. So in actual fact, we get the ability to create this. You can see graphically, um, instead of getting lost in the data, and it makes it very easy in a human readable form. So when we get to very large uh, sets of data with graphs, we can um, find the relationships. It's used by Netflix and many others for recommendations, for example, but also a way to show it back to humans in a human readable form in many ways if, in your data science team if you're trying to show explainability. Again, another example in finance uh, of how uh, various corporate relationships are working. We won't go into detail on those, but you can see again that it provides a very, you know, data is very messy, it's huge, it's sprawling, but here in one go, you can look at it as a human and understand what are these relationships, how they're working. So it just kind of like cuts through the mess of the big data. Neural compression, I'll just say a very quick thing on. Neural compression, as I mentioned, this is one of the things we need as in AI research to really um, keep on pushing forward. So I know there are quite a few things being offered in TensorFlow with TensorFlow Lite to compress uh, for compression, et cetera, and, and, and other tools and techniques out there. But I really hope that the tech majors realize that maybe it's getting less and less exciting to come out and talk about two or three trillion parameter model. Yeah, it's really exciting, but we need things that really can scale in the real world that we can put on the edge of the networks, on our mobile devices, et cetera, and sensors and things around there, and actually get relatively high, maintaining high accuracy. So small has got to become beautiful in this world we're going into of the internet of things as we go more and more away from just having things on a remote cloud server. So MIT published very fascinating research in 2019, the award-winning paper, Lottery Ticket Hypothesis. They were so excited, their team sent it to me and I uh, promised I'd publicize it. But it, it just shows the way going forwards of how we can, how they found that they could prune neural networks, the, the parts that were redundant, and still retain high, high performance levels. And that allowed you to put, because we need, you know, it, it's forecast by, by the end of 22, early 23, 1.2. 9 to 2 billion of these devices will have a GPU or AI chip on them. If we're to have deep neural networks more and more on the device, we, we don't, we've got to make them more compressed and efficient and high performing and not just giant, giant networks sitting on a remote cloud server if we want real time engagement, including on cars, et cetera. Federated learning, again, I think this is going to be really huge in terms of enabling AI to work in healthcare and finance and perhaps even across autonomous driving, collaborative learning. Think of it in a simplistic way. We still start at time T0 with our model, training it on the cloud, but then we send it to uh, devices, which could decentralized devices. They could be mobiles. They could be uh, servers in hospitals, um, you know, decentralized uh, local hospitals, if you like, as well. And then what happens is with federated learning combined with differential privacy, we don't remove the data from either the mobile or the local hospital, we learn on that decentralized data, on that, that local server, if you like, and then we go back to the centralized server and we update globally the parameters of the model, the internal learnings, if you like, without removing the data. So the data stays where it is, allowing data security. There has been an argument of adversarial attacks hacking in, encrypt it, just use encryption then. Um, <clears throat> There are various techniques, we won't go into that, like federated averaging and others, to get around potentially corrupt data, corrupted data to prevent ruining the entire model. But this is going to be really, really important to scaling AI through areas like healthcare and finance, where privacy is a big, big barrier to scaling AI right now. So NVIDIA with King's College Hospital in London, this is a showed how it could actually work in the real world with a successful trial where they actually managed to deploy federated learning across the hospitals of King's College and actually learn through the um, uh, decentralized server and aggregate it whilst maintaining uh, uh, privacy, uh, uh, data privacy for the patient. So I think two to three years from now, this is going to be a huge game changer to really allow transformational change to come in healthcare and other areas. Because right now, many of the startups in healthcare face that challenge, whereby to go to the next level, they need more and more data. But then if the hospitals are sitting there going, well, we can't give it to you, um, you know, you, you, you get to a point where you, you get a, a point of resistance. So hopefully this is going to be a game changer there. But also, as I say, for areas like finance, where collaborative learning could really help scale there with the privacy, insurance, and indeed autonomous driving. 
where you don't want people hacking into local data and, and, and causing problems, maybe federated learning with differential privacy could still allow cars and car companies to combine knowledge together and learn together. So this is just that statistic of how many devices are going to have uh, AI chips in them. It's 1.25 billion forecast by counterpoint research by 2022. So this is why we have to get also neural compression if we're going to have more and more deep learning on actually locally on these devices rather than remote cloud service. And why does that matter? So let's finally get into the nitty gritty of why that's really important. Coming into the real world, 5G and edge computing. So essentially, AI is not, not happening in isolation. If you think on that earlier slide, this revolution in deep learning and AI in general happened in parallel with data growing on, uh, through social media, mobile, the advance from 3G to 4G enabled the likes of social media giants like Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera, which is owned by Google, uh, sorry, by Facebook, sorry, and um, YouTube, et cetera, all these things, Uber, et cetera, to Airbnb to explode and that data that generated as a result. 5G is going to be a different order of magnitude from any of those before. And it's really going to enable that network for autonomous systems and others to really take off. So when Adam hosted that system on um, um, autonomous driving, I was trying to say when Adam was asking the question, so guys, what's one of the challenges we have out there? And I was like, you also need 5G because you need machine-to-machine -machine communication. Think about it. An autonomous vehicle needs to collaborate with all the other things around it. It needs to collaborate with its environment. If it's making decisions in isolation, it's more likely to have an accident or something go wrong. So 5G networks, um, and it's the same in Canada, so UK and EU, but also in Canada, you know, in the period we are now, 2020 to 22, is when it's really taking off. But it's in its absolute infancy. We've had a lot of politics between the former US President Trump and uh, the UK and elsewhere, which forced out Huawei. We can talk about the rights and wrongs of that, and um, brought in Nokia and Ericsson. However, when I talk to the industry uh, networks, the telecoms networks in private, they say we're having to rip out the equipment and put in a new equipment, and that's delayed it by minimum of a year. We're ripping out the Huawei equipment and uh, Ericsson and Nokia equipment going in, which means we're somewhere where one to two years behind. And it's actually China, which is likely, along with South Korea, to get the first large sets of data from 5G around 2022, which is really going to allow applications of deep learning to go into it. But what, why does it really matter to us in, in AI and deep learning? Well, we're going to get a massive reduction in latency. So 5G, when you get to standalone 5G networks, not those piggybacking in 4G, which is mostly what's happening right now, you're going to get to down to one millisecond to four milliseconds of latency. Augmented reality and virtual reality, which don't work right now properly, um, they kind of really stall with 4G, will start to work because of low latency. A massive increase in connectivity. 4G networks are often maxed out around the world, certainly in parts of Canada, the US and UK um, and, and Europe. Uh, they can't take many more devices, which means you can't really scale for, for uh, the IoT. So this shows, this slide, this infographic really shows the, 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 the advantages of 5G, which is that this getting as low as one millisecond latency. So in China, for example, in 2019, they conducted remote brain surgery on a Parkinson's patient where the surgeon was 3,000 kilometers, if you convert that to miles, almost 2,000 miles, about 1,800, 1,900 miles away from the patient, real time, successfully conducted on a 5G network. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing, right? So we, you start, you'll be able to have your, um, start reaching remote healthcare into places it can't reach right now. Massive increase in uh, efficiency of the network, availability of the network coverage, 90% reduction in energy usage of the network. We're in the era of climate change and we want to, we, we want to um, you know, get enhanced energy consumption or efficiency rather. 10 year battery life. And crucially in our use case of the IoT and scaling AI across the IoT, up to a hundred times more connected devices per square unit of measurement compared to 4G LTE huge, huge uh, game changer, and a thousand times more bandwidth. So a lot more uh, real-time data. So we go, if we look at this diagram on the right, we're going from this world where we're talking about thousands of cloud servers around the world to billions of edge devices, billions on the bottom. 
So your mobile device, sensors, et cetera, sensors in factories, sensors around your home and office are going to be at the edge of the network. An autonomous car is an edge of the network. This is increasingly where AI is going to sit, not on a remote cloud server. So today, when you, um, I've left my mobile on the other side of the table, but when you use a mobile device, it's going to a remote cloud server and it's fetching data back, client server request, et cetera, and you get a degree of latency. But the AI, the deep learning, the machine learning is sitting on that remote cloud server and then sending responses back. In this future world we're going into, I say future, we're going into it now and next year or two, the AI will increasingly be on the devices around you, which means you get near real-time engagement. Because think of an autonomous car. It can't wait for a remote cloud server to reply to it and go, yep, turn left. Oh, traffic light's gone green, now go. Oh, it's red, stop. You'll get accidents. It needs to make decisions on the car itself, on the device, real time. But it's not just going to be autonomous cars. It's going to be in healthcare. It's going to be even on your mobile phone and things around you. So you get on the fly engagement with the customers, a whole new world and autonomous robots, et cetera. So this is the enabler and we'll come into examples now. This is what I really wanted to talk about. Everything I was talking about before was more background. So more data, more devices, instant response. That's from the UK government, Ofcom. I think that summarizes it nicely. So here's an interesting one. Now you can, you can disagree with the number 75 billion but the low case numbers I've seen are more 50 billion. You know, it doesn't matter. Is it 50 billion or 75 billion from Statista? But let's say Statista, this forecast by Statista was right. 75 plus internet connected devices by 2025. There are just under 8 billion people on this planet right now, 7.9. But let's go with eight. That's like six or seven internet connected devices per person on the planet. It's a lot, right? Even if you go down to that 50 billion forecast, it's still an awful lot. It's still over, you know, six per person, uh, over six. It's going to generate astronomic amounts of data. If we think we're in the era of big data right now, we're nowhere right now. And that's why I believe there's not going to be another AI winter just because we didn't hit AGI, which I think was already unrealistic to think we'd hit that right now. The demand for machine learning and deep learning is only going to go up. Smart sensors, AI and the edge. It's from IDC and it shows this. So you see, you can see where we are right now, 2020 to 2022, 2021 on the data, right? And we, we already say we're in this era of big data that we're generating massive amounts of data far more than ever in human history, right? Well, look where we're going by 2025. Look at our exponential increase. Now, the thing that IDC say is that 30% of that data being created in 2025 will be real time, consumed real time. That is more data than we're actually creating in total in 2020 that we created, past tense, or even currently pre pretty much the entirety of what we're creating right now in 2021. Real time consumed. So edge computing is going to be really important. AI on the edge. Machine learning will have to be there. Deep learning will have to be there to make sense of that data and engage that real time responses to the customer. Remember what I was saying about the customer experience. Customers want real time you know, frictionless experiences. 30% that 175 billion zettabytes, <laughs> real time. <laughs> That's almost 60 billion, right? Zettabytes. That's a huge amount. A lot of AI on the edge. So what does it mean commercially when we talk about value? Let's look at the entertainment sector. Intel Oven, looking at entertainment sector, the media sector, said that 5G will contribute to 2028, $1 trillion in revenue. And again, that tipping point, they say 50% 2025. But for me, the interesting trajectory is 2022 to 2028 or 2022 to 2025, that rapid growth. And if you remember that KPMG chart that we looked at earlier that showed that rapid growth in AR intelligent automation, 22 to 25, that nicely chimes in with that because just like deep learning exploded with 4G as Facebook, Instagram, Amazon, Airbnb, so on and so forth, took off, right, on the mobile. So too, our next generation and demand for deep learning, machine learning, et cetera, is really going to accelerate as 5G scales. And we'll really start to make, find that data science and deep learning is making deep inroads into every single sector of the economy. There'll be no choice because data is being generated real time. Customer wants real time interactions. 
So this just shows how every sector, the finance sector, this is my own infographic, will be um, disrupted by data science and AI, right from the back end, right to the front end, payments, retail banking, investment banking, healthcare, another one of my infographics, um, whether it's drug discovery, where AI is already having huge inroads, there are some exciting startups in Canada as well, and the US and the UK that have attracted a lot of money and making big advances there in de novo drug discovery, uh, medical imaging, electronic health records, clinical trials. Clinical trial needs a lot of disruption. We've seen with the COVID vaccine how fast we can go if there's really a will. Right now, um, you can see the problem in drug discovery is that um, a very small number of candidates make it through all the way through. Here's the example of the US with the FDA. And the pharma sector says it's spending 2.6 billion. Some say it's 500 billion, uh, half a billion per dr uh, candidate drug. Either way, it's a lot of money. And less than 12% make it all the way through. So your risk is very high. And as I pointed out before, the number of molecules, potential molecules, combinations is more than, there are small molecules, is more than there are atoms in the universe. We don't know a lot of it. We don't actually know what they look like. And we don't know the, where the hidden cures for cancer, et cetera, might be, and other complex diseases. And before, because these costs of uh, developing these drugs are so high and so complicated and taking 10 or 12 years to go through, often the pharma sector was ignoring um, rare but really debilitating diseases. And now, hopefully, by scaling deep learning and deep reinforcement learning, for that matter, into this area, and indeed transformers are having a big impact here on chemistry, we can hopefully bring these costs down very substantially and accelerate very quickly so that not only complex diseases like cancer, which, but also ones that are relatively smaller in terms of um, number of people being affected by them, but really has life-changing consequences for them, can now start to become economically feasible to go and attack with bio biotechnology. So huge, huge advances coming in this field. So here's actually an output. This is a drug discovery model I built with my team um, just over a year ago to show you what it actually does. So these are synthetic molecules. It's actually gone and generated itself. And then on the chart up there, it's testing it for known toxicities to humans. Because you don't want to create chemical molecules that actually go and kill people, right? It's not a very good drug, is it? <laughs> You're trying to cure people, not, not, not make them ill or kill them. So yeah, we find things that will successfully, it's, it's known as molecular duck, ducking, that will successfully engage in molecular ducking, because not all potential molecules will successfully molecularly duck, it goes into physics, and that's part of the problem. So you, you, you create new co molecular compounds, they duck together, and you're done trying to work out, are they toxic to humans, and will they actually solve for a uh, disease? So again, visualizing the future with 5G and holographic interfaces. Holog ho holographic uh, technology is going to work with 5G, by the way. And the video, if, if, I, if I was able to screen share, I would run a video showing you from Microsoft how you know our future Right now, we're all on Zoom or, or we're, uh, the, the, the platform we're using right now with Camdia. But in the future, instead of seeing each other in 2D, we'll be seeing each other as 3D holograms. And with a uh, new neural translation, with transformers, I could be speaking in English. And if you're a Mandarin speaker in, in China, you could be hearing me in Mandarin or Japanese in Japan, German, etc. And what it means, in, I don't need to get in those long haul travels and fly to the other side of the world for that twice a year business meeting. And then I don't see my client again for six months. And in the meantime, I lose a lot of traction with them because they're doing a lot of their other deals with others. I can now touch base with them once a week, twice a week without those expensive travels, without all that huge carbon footprint <clears throat> and talk to them in their own language, even though I don't know their own language and maintain a closer relationship with them and they're seeing me as a 3D hologram. It's quite a game changer. So you can see a doctor popping up here um, and your doctor could see you um, and, and actually diagnose you better, maybe, remotely. So huge, huge uh, game changes coming up um, over the next few years. This is actually the output from that um, Microsoft video I wanted to show you. Um, it's great, go and have a look. Uh, if you want, just type in Google search, Microsoft hologram uh, and actually, the lady is on the right. She's actually the one speaking, uh, hosting. And that's a 3D hologram in front. Looks very realistic. And it's speaking fluent Japanese in her voice. So that's the world we're going into with 5, 5G-enabled technology as VR and AR start to work as intended, which they don't with 4G. Give it a couple of years, and the smart glasses are coming. And I think they'll actually replace mobile phones. So maybe next year, you're, 
this year or next year might be the last mobile phone you buy. Who knows? Um, that by 2025, 2026, we're all wearing the, the 5G enabled glasses and using those to, to hold our conversations and engaging with the world around us. This is the world I see that I get excited about. Digital to physical convergence. The two actually coming together. And that's what I'm talking about, scaling AI across the economy. It means we're coming beyond social media and beyond e-commerce to the real world. And 5G is going to be key in enabling that as we merge with AR and VR, et cetera, and these customer experiences and really converge those physical and digital worlds together. So let's look at some visions of this future. This is, again, uh, one of my, my uh, uh, infographics where I can see retail in the future and entertainment combined together. So the, la the lady there, the girl, she's, she's wearing her 5G enabled glasses and she's engaging you know, through hand gestures. Uh, it's Justin Bieber, Canadians. I know not all Canadians are a great fan of him, so apologies. <laughs> I don't know which side of the equation you are. But anyway, I'm not, a, I'm not a Bieber fan myself, but just in case, maybe I should have put Drake or someone else. But anyway, you get the picture. Personalized entertainment. She's there in her own world with her holographic glasses, engaging with her favorite stars, and she can buy the T-shirt, just swipe and buy it or buy a ticket to his concert. And the algorithm can learn and highly personalize to her. That is the world we're going into. I had one of Cristiano Ronaldo because I showed it to Qataris because they got a 5G network in, in, in November 2019 trying to show them what they could do for the World Cup with 5G and AI. But anyway, I missed that one. Autonomous cars generates a lot of excitement. And if we use the UK as a proxy, but I believe the statistics are not too dissimilar in Canada maybe and the US, that, I mean, they're not so, as dramatic in the US, but certainly we're seeing this trend. It's people delaying owning a car, the young. Um, the financial crisis, job uncertainty, etc. The fact that many of the young in their 20s are staying, living with their parents for much longer, often until they're 20 out of 30. Getting a car used to be the first thing you did when you turned 22, 23 and you had your first paycheck. Now it's not so important. And so in the UK, a staggering 40% less young drivers had a driving license than 10 years ago. 40%, this statistic came out in 2018, 2019. Huge, huge reduction, right, to over a 10 year period. As things like Uber, we have Uber in the UK, but I think in, in the US we have Lyft as well. So Credit Suisse say that if we get to genuine autonomy by around 2030, people will actually stop buying cars. And they'll think about it. What will that do to your city? What will that do to Toronto or Montreal or New York or London or Paris? It means you don't need all these giant car parks anymore, right? Because the autonomous car will pick you up, drop you off, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, next journey. And then if it needs a, uh, if it hasn't got a journey, it could sit somewhere at the edge of the city in some, you know, lot or somewhere and then come back. It's going to have ramifications for society that we haven't thought about yet when we do get there. We're not there yet, but when it does get there. And it'll have a huge impact for the insurance sector. We want these things to be a lot safer and have a lot less casualties and accidents, but it will also mean the insurance sector will make a lot less money as accidents go down. It will also mean, which I think overall for humanity is a good thing, challenge for the insurance sector, tire companies. Um, you know, if there are less cars on the road because we're earning less of them, what does it mean for the leasing sector? A huge amount of loans from banking and leasing come for cars. What does it mean for the property sector? If there are less car parks and we're going to redesign the, 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 our city centers, as COVID's already given that challenge, it's less people going into the offices. So a lot of changes coming through. And it also means that the, 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 the experience inside the vehicle is going to change. This is one of my other infographics saying you could be having in-car entertainment, in car shopping on the on the fly on the fly real time right this is what i'm talking about on the edge and on the fly um the car detects this anna this peter because remember anna and peter don't own the car anymore in this world it's driving from one to the other it could be picking up adam next it could be picking me up adam squared me adam and adam <laughs> together into adam and adam delgado adam squared anyway the point is it's going to personalize the interior experience because now people are not driving. They could be working, they could be watching a movie, whatever. On the fly, real time engagement, 
as people are going through their journeys now, completely different. And we're talking about machine to machine communication and how things can get safer. Um, and this need for 5G, and then we get 6G around 2030, maybe even 28, we'll see in some places, South Korea, maybe. But let's say 2030 for 6G, which will be even faster and probably start to enable brain brain computer interfaces to work more, more effectively, which I think won't quite happen with 5G. But with 5G, we need this machine to machine communication for autonomous systems to really work because they need to collaborate together. So here you've got this car at the front, the silver one broken, broken down. But look, it's not in the line of sight of that gray car behind the red one and the other red one back there. But they're all communicating to each other what they're seeing and detecting. Collaborative learning, right? So if it was fog or bad weather conditions, they could also be communicating to each other, telling each other, so they can all communicate. And in, in, in London and other cities, they're putting some of the five small 5G transmitters into the lampposts. So again, the car can be communicating with the lamppost, and we'll see an example of that. So things are going to communicate with each other, which means massive amounts of communication, 5G to handle that, massive amounts of data, but also allowing collaborative learning and optimization for autonomous systems to work, which they don't in the current 4G environment. And all of this intelligence on the device, on the machine itself. The retail store, this was my vision of the future retail store. Actually, I would change it now. I would change it and I'll explain why. I believe we're seeing physical retail really bleed and uh, hemorrhage. And, and what all around the world and brands in the US and the UK and Canada that have been around for a long time disappearing like that. And brands that five or 10 years ago were huge. Now, I believe that uh, the physical stores have a problem and it's called inventory. <laughs> and you might say, hang on, they need the inventory to sell. Yes. But actually, in the stores, they don't sell 50, 60 to 80% of their inventory at full price, if at all. So it's a huge cash cost they're facing. What if you were to make it an experience center, merging e the e-commerce experience or mobile commerce experience with the physical experience? Because you're still getting a lot of returns, for example, on inventory and clothes because it doesn't fit. So you went, go into your store and you get a personal experience. They take a tape measurement of you, sit down, enjoy our VR, VR lounge for free whilst you engage with our adverts and our, our range. And by the way, you can do some free gaming, et cetera, because you engage with our brand. And if you order anything, order to home or order to store. I would not have the um, smart mirrors. I know Farfetch have invested a lot into them. They might not like me saying this. I looked into them, but they're expensive. I think we we'll just shortcut it and go straight to the glasses. I think with the glasses, you'll be able to put, put them on and see what you might look like um, in a 3D, um, 3D sense. So I think we'll actually shortcut the, the, smart, the smart mirrors because smart mirrors are very expensive, up to $20,000 or more to, to, to really make work properly. I think it will be very glasses driven and people are human. Uh, humans are love uh, to socialize. We actually like going to the malls. We're just not spending in them. Or when we are spending, it's usually in the coffee shop or the restaurant. We're, not, we're just not buying as much in the physical stores. So actually, if the retailers were smart, they would actually take this jump and say, okay, we'll digitize the whole thing. Order to store or order to home. We'll take measurements. We'll have a professional stylist, give you advice and measurements. Come in, engage with us. We'll learn about you and we'll keep that relationship. Become like a cafe with a bar internally. That's anyway my vision, but they don't listen to me. I told them that five years ago. The brands I told, a couple of them don't exist today. Their choice. So again, with this experience, like I said, I, I, I believe the smart mirror won't be there. I think it'll be more AR and VR lounge. And it just shows you the edge, though, the edge, how we're going to be more and more at the edge, AR and VR to dominate. So that, And this personalized experience. Like, and again, this is just more examples of AR and the edge, but it's a mobile, autonomous robot, autonomous delivery vehicle, Smart mirror, but like I said, I really think it will be glasses, not, not smart mirrors. Machine to machine communication with cars. And here, the bottom left, like the car is detecting the person and, and the traffic lights, but it's all doing it on the device locally, not going to a remote cloud server and waiting for it to explain the image and send it back because that car can't wait in case there's a delay in the image or go forward and hit someone. Yes, autonomous cleaning robots, indeed. <laughs> They're on their way. They're on their way. And indeed, renewable energy, drones, for example, uh, drones with computer vision are going over wind farms and solar farms and detecting for cracks 
in the in the machinery, which can save a lot of money and improve the efficiency of uh, renewable energy through through computer vision. That's another example. So here's another example where you got a, a sensor on a lamppost, which is five G enabled. As I said, in some cities, there are dense cities, there are actually putting small five G masts into the lamppost, and it detects a person and it's telling the car. And the other car that sees it's also telling the red car because you can see that person he's standing in between two vehicles a bit foolishly we all do it sometimes we shouldn't do it and he's about to step out because he doesn't see maybe he's got maybe he's too busy on his phone and he hasn't noticed the red cars coming along and that blue car and the lamppost are warning the red car there's a person standing there and they're about to step out so this shows how we can get to AI on the edge with collaborative learning and actually really make a difference in our cities. So enhancing safety. This again is just showing the future autonomous car, um, maybe around 2028, I think when we really start to see these things scale, that whole journey, that whole customer experience comes, picks them up because they don't own it anymore. It's like, a, they don't own their cars anymore. They're saving money on that, drives them to their office, and then the car goes to do the shopping <laughs> for them, tells them what to do. They're making a payment from their smartwatch, or maybe I should say, really, their glasses, probably. And um, the car there then picks, whilst it's got no, uh, sees that human, warns the other car, don't hit him, comes back to pick up Anna and James, or whatever his name is, take them home with the shopping already done. There you go, efficient usage of time. <laughs> uh, seamless experiences. I love this infographic. It's from Visual Capitalist, Iman, um, uh, Iman Ghosh. It really sums up this future world in a nice way. These three technologies, AI, 5G networks, and uh, big data, all working together. Well, we know big data is a fuel for AI. In this smart city world environment, the huge amount of data that's going to get generated, go and have a look at it. it I had to break it into chunks because it's too large to fit on one slide, but it's beautifully done, showing how the IoT, the Internet of Things, all these internet connected devices are going to have AI on the edge working together through 5G enablement to really change the way we live. It's also from the same infographic. Wearables, smart homes, smart cities, smart industry. I, I've done projects with predictive analytics for, for uh, smart factories to show how you can do predictive analytics to use machine learning to forecast when a fault's going to come before it actually happens. So you can enhance the asset life and stop business interruptions which are very costly i'll give an example in the car industry every one minute of unscheduled downtime because of machine interruption costs twenty-two thousand us dollars for one minute it's a lot of money right a lot of money and and it damages the equipment and these are very expensive uh, equipment sometimes robotic equipment because you have one fault there and it goes all the way through the, the other machines they'll get damaged so you can extend the, the asset life of the machinery as well you can also then start optimizing energy usage and, and, and find right times to shut down to, to also run when the electricity price is more expensive, cheaper rather, and, and reduce consumption when it's more expensive, and also shut things down which are not needed for automation and reduce your carbon footprint. Same with a smart home. Simple things like sensors that could detect a window is open whilst you've got the aircon or the heating on and shut it automatically for you. Detect that lights are left on when there's no, no, no human in the room. Switch it off unless you want it to be on, that is, because you want one light on whilst you're out, but you can program that in. So in actual fact, McKinsey did an infographic and I forgot to put it in there, which showed their version of the future home would have lots of bots in there negotiating on your behalf with service providers to get the best deals for you on electricity, on you know your, your uh, other, other things, your, your TV, your cable, et cetera. Uh, um, interesting concept, who knows? But wearables will really explode with 5G. And as I said, for me, it's really going to be the smart glasses that are going to be the big game changer and probably even change, uh, remove um, um, mobile, uh, mobile phones themselves. Um, so huge disruption coming in uh, right across everything and transportation and healthcare. So this world of tomorrow, I say tomorrow, it literally is coming over the next couple of years. As I said, change coming far faster than ever before. Edge computing on the edge of the network. Examples of today, smart thermostats, smart appliances, tomorrow, autonomous vehicles, somebody was talking about the cleaning robot, home robots. It'll take a bit longer for robotics because it's a bit more complex, the movement and uh, for 
robot, robotic perception to really understand the chaos in our real world outside of a model environment and uh, building those data sets. But I think by the end of this decade, 2020 to 2030, not unrealistic. Voice AI is getting much more powerful as we saw with the Transformers to the point that we can now really get much better NLP capabilities and do things like e-payments, for example. Um, you know, the invisible bank, increasingly, frictionless banking. Uh, vision AI, computer vision, we have it a standardized object detection now. But going forwards, real-time video analytics. So we're going to this world where it's going to be the internet of everything, the IOE, as they call it. That's one of the things that I really believe in passionately. I think mean, we'll get the, the internet of everything as we go to the next decade, 2030s. I mean, this decade, it's not about AGI. It's about getting to broader AI, which is going to work on the edge more efficiently, smaller neural compression, more efficiently, uh, building that up, those capabilities, scaling AI, data science, across the sectors of the economy, on the edge, holographic experiences that were once the stuff of movies. But actually, take a step back and think about it. Some of you who might be older um, will, will remember those movies a couple of decades ago where seeing each other on a screen was seen as the future, as we are doing right now, as a really futuristic thing in space movies. Nobody blinks an eyelid anymore. Well, Zoom or whatever, we're used to it now. So holographic is the next evolution, and we'll get there quite soon as 5G scales, two or three years. So the internet of everything is that complete physical and digital convergence that I'm very passionate about and really believe. But it is going to take time to get there. And so this is going to be an exciting decade of transformation. Challenges too. We all need a lot of reskilling and retraining. But definitely, I believe AI and data science are going to come into their own in two to three years from now. So there are challenges. There are teething problems. It's a relatively immature sector in reality. A lot of chief executives and chief marketing officers and CFOs don't really get it, even CTOs, especially in legacy companies. Some of those companies really will not be there eight to 10 years from now, probably even five years from now. So they have to become agile. They have to view technology not as a cost center, but as a potential revenue generator and build data science and technology right from the outset to enhance the customer experience in the way the technology majors do. So that is one of the big challenges, but that is where the world we're going to, the IOE. That is where we're going to, and I'm a big believer of that. And if you think it's just me saying that, this is actually research from Cambridge University, <laughs> University of Cambridge. They've been around for a while, one of the oldest universities in the world, and they're actually doing research on the internet of everything, IOE. AI and industry, digital twinning, having a big impact there. This is, a, I had to give credit to Siemens for this image. It's actually a Siemens showing one of their factories with a, a duplicate, a digital duplicate of their, their factory. So you can detect problems before they actually occur with simulations when the factory is new and actually prevent them from happening and actually build in efficiencies right from the, the beginning. My own work, um, I used to, my own work, I came from the energy sector. We used to deal with huge amounts of big data before it was called big data. <laughs> real, real huge amounts of big data modeling, modeling the entire electricity and energy network of the UK, Europe, North America, <laughs> things I used to do. And uh, and then watching the Excel, yes, Excel and VBA. <laughs> I'm watching it all crash. <laughs> uh, the nightmares we used to have giving my age away uh, in those days. Um, so I do a lot, and I was one of the pioneers in working in green energy and green finance. Um, Morgan Stanley, I built that business from inception. So I moved beyond uh, doing all the data, data analytics, as we called it then, uh, Monte Carlo modeling and simulations, et cetera, to um, Markov chains, to, to becoming a marketing and finance guy right in the forefront. And I created a business globally from inception and became a leader in the field, at least according to Fortune magazine and CNN and Al Jazeera, et cetera, New York Times. And then I went on to study AI, <laughs> postgraduate research, um, as you do, uh, check and uh, go back and uh, catch up with the latest technologies, publish research and portfolio optimization with deep learning. And now I'm applying all of that back to scaling climate finance, um, which is coming back into fashion now, because I want to build, bring large scale finance into uh, enabling 5G technologies and uh, renewable energy projects at scale using permission blockchain 
and not not public one, but permissioned one. Uh, but a lot of using transformers for time series analytics and uh, text analytics, we built explainable AI, et cetera. So hopefully next time I'll actually be able to give you a demo of that, where we've pretty much built, almost completed the work on the back end and now going into front end. So that's what I do myself. But one of our big challenges is going to be solving climate change. We've seen that recent hurricane that and the problems the storm built to the, 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 the New York and other parts of the US. We've seen the record temperatures in Canada earlier. You know, going going uh, over 40 degrees Celsius. We've seen Siberia, the Arctic Circle, in June or July this year, hit 48 degrees Celsius in the Arctic Circle. Never recorded before. <laughs> These are not isolated events. Um, Canada, northern Canada, hitting the high 40s. Fires all over all over um, um, California last year and this year. Greece, uh, Turkey, other areas. These are not. You know, the trends are becoming more and more clear. And if we believe in data science, this is what the data science was saying for the last two, three decades. So yes, you'll get cold spells. Yes, you'll get warm spells. But overall, we can see extreme weather events increasing. So my own work is trying to see what we can do and scaling. And in actual fact, a lot of the talk has been, and I think some of the resentment or pushback happens from people who say, well, I don't want to give up my quality of life to fight for future generations. On climate change. Well, hang on, I'm trying to show that with AI and 5G technology, it doesn't have to be an either or. Yes, we will have to make changes, but it doesn't, but with the better, the more enhanced clean technologies, as PwC have shown to actually give uh, numbers to my arguments, we can actually create jobs and GDP growth, but actually reduce emissions. So PwC in a report commissioned by Microsoft showed we could add 5.2 trillion dollars to the economy increase 4.4% GDP, just in four sectors of the economy alone, agriculture, energy, transportation, and water by 2030. That's an awful lot of money. Increasing a lot of jobs, 38 million jobs, but reducing greenhouse gas emissions 4% across those sectors alone. That's a huge amount. That's the amount of our national country, in a medium-sized country in Europe. And 5G is forecast by Accenture to increase taking the US as an example, 3 million jobs, $275 billion in investment, and $500 billion in GDP growth. And after COVID, we want that, right? After the COVID crisis, we all want that all over the world, Canada, the US, Europe, wherever you are. That is what we want. So drilling into a bit more detail, this is what PwC said in that report commissioned by, by uh, Microsoft um, on these just four, just four sectors of the economy. We can decrease emissions by the amount shown below and the lower level, but increase GDP contributions on the numbers shown above. So it doesn't have to be an either or. And my view is like, we've got nearly 8 billion people on this planet. The forecast is we're going to hit 11, 10 or 11 billion by 2050. The more extreme environmental groups say we should deindustrialize and go back to the way we were 200 years ago. Well, hang on, we'll just do what we did before, cut down all the trees, that's what we did as humans and deforest everything because then they use firewood for, for, for you know, trees for uh, fire, etc. That's not going to be a good outcome. Um, you know, 8 billion people, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> but equally, we don't have to stay in this era of heavy, dirty industry. Technology, um, AI enabled technology and 5G enabled with the fourth industrial revolution means we can go very quickly, hopefully, into this cleaner world and more efficient technologies where we can actually optimize energy consumption, energy efficiency, and scale renewable energy, um, autonomous vehicles, electrification of the grid, electric vehicles, et cetera, and transform things. The hydrogen economy, I know there are challenges there. It won't happen overnight. AI could play a role in helping uh, enhance that technology on the storage of fuel cells. And maybe by the third, 2030s, green hydrogen will become more cost efficient, and then airlines won't emit so much. And again, you won't have to travel as much for those business meetings with 5G enabled AI technology and our smart glasses. If we can be having those meetings all around the world virtually. Um, so a lot of potential there. Rola, Rolnika Alia, and I said, yeah, Alia, I gave her three examples, just some famous names that co authored that paper. Yosha Benjo, if you're in Canada, might have heard of that chap <laughs> in Montreal. Demis Asibis, sorry, I missed an S, Demis, uh, the, the co founder of. Uh, DeepMind, very famous computer scientist, and Andrew Eng, who a few of you might have heard, Stanford professor, visiting professor at 
and uh, co-founder of Coursera. And what we can see is they've shown across the sectors how machine learning can be applied to actually help tackle um, climate change, right from the design stage, sourcing, manufacturing, distribution. Let me give you an example. I gave the retail sector. I think many won't realize how big the problem is. The annual cost of unsold inventory, depending on who you believe, is $300 billion to $1 trillion a year. Take a step back, think of that number again. $300 billion is the low range, $1 trillion is the high range. Either way, it's an awful lot of money. It's a huge economic cost. Now, the luxury retailers will either de uh, delabel because they don't want a discount because they sell hit their exclusivity. So they either rip the label off and put it to a discount store, an outlet store, or they shred and burn it. A lot of them shred and burn. So think about the illogicality of this world we're living in. We're manufacturing somewhere in Far East Asia, low cost, and we're shipping it all the way to Canada, the US, UK, and London, et cetera, Paris, et cetera, for our stores, or, or, or flying it over or putting it on a ship, whichever way. And then a huge amount of it's not selling. And then we're destroying it. <laughs> it's madness. And a lot of the retailers are hemorrhaging through the nose. And that was my vision of saying, why? Why stick with that model? Why not create this digital experience as you saw on that slide earlier? And you engage with the customers. They still like to go in and engage with that experience. Just hold a few items in inventory and tell them you'll either bring to store whilst they're there, engaging with your gaming equipment from a local warehouse, or you'll send it to their home. But you still build, keep that relationship with the customer. That's just one example I'm giving. That's my vision anyway. But all the way through, whether it be supply chains, the factories, et cetera, the huge inroads we can make because right now our model is not sustainable. And if anything, I think that's one of the lessons we learned with COVID. I, I know there are really exotic and weird ideas about how COVID came, 5G nonsense, or uh, which is completely non-feasible, or because why then was uh, COVID exploding in countries like Iran that had no 5G, right? Even though it's scientifically nonsense anyway, but you got that simple correlation that shows it. And in Japan was a lag out on 5G, and yet Japan was, you know, had COVID cases initially. Um, so why was that the case? And why was South Korea, who's one of the world leaders in 5G, having very low COVID cases? Didn't make any sense, but we're in a world of no logic. So, so yes, reducing food wastage, absolutely. Yes, yes, Guri, absolutely. That is another one. And they did look at that in this paper. Have a look. Um, we are going to have to solve for a lot of these efficiencies. Agricultural sector with 5G and AI for optimization of output and um, you know, feeding this growing world whilst reducing pollution. These are all challenges that we need to, to, to meet. And that is where I'm applying more and more of my time, where I'm building my own, network, uh, my own models, my own business on scaling climate finance, combining AI and blockchain. I think that's pretty much a summary of what I had to say, which is that I'm trying to leave on a positive note. I tried to cover, I couldn't cover everything because you now we could get there's so much R&D research going on. What I would say, is R&D is one thing, and we have a lot of cutting edge things going on R&D. Production is another. And any of you who work in data science will know that. You've got things that happen in R&D, and for example, some of those deep mind things are not ready for the production environment. They're exciting on a research level, but you try and put them into production in your, in your company, and it could go off, maybe not do what you, and you can spend a year chasing yourself in a circle. Maybe two, three years in, from now, we'll get easier and easier things that to pull out a, a, a box and plug in. But we're in a situation where organizations need to really understand data and analytics. Data is the fuel. We're going into this world of um, really, really rapid change. I can't say that enough. You know, I showed you my mobile. Here's a NVIDIA Jetson Tip 2. You know, this is what we, I used to use computer vision on on drones and autonomous robots, small, it's lightweight, you know, we can't, these giant models are, are exciting, I'm sure, as I said, uh, GPT-4 might be even bigger, but I really hope that when they get to GPT-5 next year, they start thinking more and more about neural compression, because for GPT-5 and others to be useful, we need to make them more and more scalable across the economy and useful to the sectors of all, all the different sectors and start dealing with these challenges like causal inferencing as neurosymbolic AI is trying to do. And I know DeepMind have put out a challenge saying we can also do it with deep neural networks, 
but we've still got the explainability problems some of that, those areas with their deep reinforcement learning. And that's going to be key to solving going forwards. And at least neurosymbolic AI makes it an attempt there. Um, so um, as I say, I'm a big proponent of transformers. I think they're very exciting. I think over the next two years, we're going to see a lot of continued advances there, not just in NLP, but continued with computer vision and time series analytics. Time series is another area that is going to have more and more uh, potential, especially as we go more and more to the edge and we're trying to deal with more and more time series data uh, around us. So very, very exciting times coming up for us. Uh, all of us are in the data science space. The, the, the excitement and the magic hasn't started yet. There are challenges right now and there will continue to be challenges as we're still in an immature, relatively immature sector. So don't despair when you, when you hit those headaches. We all hit them right now. Um, but as 5G scales over the next two years, the magic's going to come. Can't behavioral biometrics defeat GANs? What are your thoughts on that there, MTS? <clears throat> well, I think, as I said right now, that fear of GANs is a bit too much because if you actually try and simulate, uh, there's a reason why they didn't play a role in the US elections on social media as was feared because uh, we, we, I, I tried, I did a couple of PhDs who were really enthusiastic. We tried, to, we tried synthetic media, as it's called. And what you find is that when you go beyond what's known as the first order model, um, it's very hard to do the lip, lip synchronization um, with the voice of the person. So um, as things stand right now, you, you can, and, and because the GANs are unsupervised, they can do small things that an expert can pick up. It can be on the teeth, it can be on the ears. They're bad with things like earrings and teeth, uh, bits of the, the uh, eye, et cetera, that a well-trained expert would actually pick up on. So, so they're really amazing in terms of generating these images from noise. It's, it's fantastic what they're achieving. Um, but um, the, many times, as I say, uh, it's not quite there for synthetic media uh, in the way people fear. Maybe two, three years from now, we might be having to have this discussion again about um, uh, behavior, as you say, that because if it's behaving in such a way that is irrational, in a way that a human would, uh, you could say that. There are those playing devil's advocate who say a lot of humans these days are not behaving rationally either, so maybe that won't work, especially in social media, so I don't know. Given the future techs you mentioned, what would be the potential good industry for entrepreneurs to look more into? I mean, look, there are going to be a few. Right now, as you'll be, be aware, the, the, the VCs generally, investors generally, are focused on SaaS uh, enterprise um, because... B2C has been higher risk uh, high, because customer acquisition costs are high, scaling is high. So, you know, if you're creating another mobile app or another social media application and you're going up against Google, ByteDance, Facebook, et cetera, it's not easy. And even big platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn don't grow so rapidly anymore. Now, um, and likewise, are you going to go up against Amazon, et cetera, or others have got very powerful data sets and machine learning teams? So. But the one thing that you do see is every time we went to a new G, that's when the new B2C <laughs> giants came out. When we went to 4G, that's when many of these social media giants came out. That's when many, Airbnb, Uber, et cetera, uh, Revely, who I sat next to when they, co -found, when they founded a the company, <laughs> I used to go have drinks with them and that, when they were just when nobody knew who they were. Now the company's valued at $33 billion um, five years later. Now, what... When we get to 5G, we we'll probably will have a short window of opportunity for that next wave of B2C to come through because of huge disruption. But I mean, in terms of the enterprise side, definitely things linked to IoT, Internet of Things, um, linked to uh, manufacturing. Um, healthcare has had opportunities and challenges. I think AI will still be big in healthcare, but I think federated learning is really going to have to take off there to really like scale in a lot of places uh, to, 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 to uh, two to three years from now. So, and this whole entertainment space, um, video conferencing, business meetings, you know, the, the imagination is the limit. <laughs> I don't want to tell you necessarily where the opportunities are because I could then put you off things that may be the next big thing. But really, it's about trying to see you don't want to be too early and you don't want to be too late. You don't want to be doing it when everyone else is doing it. 
but you don't want to be there so early that it just won't take off. So, for example, my idea of scaling um, climate finance through uh, blockchain combined with machine learning, I actually planned to do it in 2015. And I went to the UK regulator and they said the EU won't allow it right now, won't allow uh, blockchain finance and um, it's an issuance of debt and equity through blockchain. So I parked down and I went back to university. In the meantime, my friends at Revolut t- developed a $33 billion company whilst I was studying deep learning. <laughs> but uh, uh, but now I see it's come back. Now I see that issuance is occurring. Um, so that vision I had in 2015 is starting to happen now in its infancy. So maybe I was six years too early, but um, I'm now building it. So it's not, timing is all the key thing. Time, being there at the right time, the right, that right moment. You know, you look at Steve Jobs. He wasn't often the very first in many of those things. The smartphone was already there, but he executed it far better. He really nailed in the cu- customer experience. One of the things he said, if you look at one of his video interviews, was, I'm not trying to build a technology and then back fit it, back solve it to a customer problem. I'm trying to build the technology around enhancing the customer experience and giving value to the customer. And that's how my technology scales. And that's what the one thing I think Apple did very well in the Steve Jobs. You can argue maybe they lost the innovation. <laughs> Since then, I don't know. We'll see when Apple Glasses come out, uh, how that goes. Um, and indeed, they're going to face a lot of challenges from the likes of Facebook and Microsoft, who are investing a lot into the space of 5G enabled glasses as well. So we'll see what, what happens with that over the next two years. But be agile because a lot of changes are coming. A query on the skin cancer slide. The grad camp heat mat for the second uh, challenging lesion was impressive. How did you achieve that? Yeah, as I say, we, we used a lot of techniques. And it was quite a while ago when we did that. You know, we actually did that three years ago. <laughs> Shows you, so we tried to be a bit ahead of our time. Um, we, we did a lot of um, uh, smite and um, oversampling of the underrepresented classes because there were seven imbalanced classes. So I think a combination of really trying to um, get the, ba- the data set balanced and uh, through, through uh, data augmentation um, and really good practice in terms of um, avoiding overfitting um, and yeah, just good coding. I had a very good engineers at the time <laughs> with me. Uh, the chap who actually worked with me on that has gone to publish a lot of breakthrough research in the field. So I think I think it's just really adopting good practice and making sure that you you um, think of your data set very carefully, especially when you get into these situations where you've got um, imbalanced data sets. Because the reality is in the real world, when you come to the real world, a lot of your data sets are going to be imbalanced. You know, uh, another example is when you deal with fraud detection in finance. Your instances of fraud are very small, but they can be very costly. So you, you have to... In the case of fraud, there's a lot of work on synthetic gen- data generation, but then your synthetic data generation has to be realistic because if you create examples of data that aren't representative of the real world, it's garbage in, garbage out. And with healthcare, of course, that has real world implications in terms of safety. So um, what, what we've tended to see, for example, Google had that uh, binary classification. And of course, with binary classification, you can get to 99% accuracies or whatever. Where, with their diabetes, I believe it was, where they're getting to very high accuracies at that 99% level. But when they deployed it in the real world, I think somewhere in Southeast Asia, they were getting close to 79 to 80% hits, which is still good, but way down from where they thought they were going to be in the lab. And that was because the way the medical staff were, were holding the devices, the quality of the images in that real world operational setting in the hospitals and the clinics was very different from that environment in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a computer science lab. So that, I think, is our big challenge in, in areas like healthcare, is translating it back to a real-world practitioner setting. So, for example, I mentioned I have two brothers. My, 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 my younger brother, the youngest out of the two, just completed his, is completing his PhD at UCL. He's a qualified medic, but he's done, done a medical imaging. So he's the crossover between medicine and, and computer, computer image, computer image and deep learning. And there... Um, um, as he pointed out, his work has been closely trying to bring that real-world practitioner side to the data scientists, to the machine learning team, on both labeling of the data and in terms of the performance, testing the performance of the models. 
so that you got practitioners, medical practitioners working alongside the deep learning engineers, the, deep, the data scientists. And that I think is more and more the world we have to go into. When you look at what deep mind achieved, when, when deep learning was first exploding in 2016, 2017 on the, the computer vision side, you used to have some, some of the marketing hype would say, hey, we don't need human experts anymore, like you do with feature engineering and the other machine learning techniques. We don't need the domain experts. We're just going to blast this deep learning everywhere and take over the world. Well, actually, you do need the domain experts because otherwise you still risk garbage in, garbage out. But in terms of the solving the problem and making sure end-to-end -end pipeline really does well and performs well in a real-world setting. So whether it's at your, your data ingestion side uh, level and, uh, and, and, and the way you're creating that data pipeline, right through to testing the model performance at the end, you do want that... that um, that domain expertise in there. So for example, I gave the finance example. We've gone and taken, I work with our, our team directly, hand labeling, it was very time consuming, but hand labeling 5,000 uh, 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 text image uh, examples rather, were, were, were things that were related to the finance world, a bit of earnings before interest tax and depreciation. So if I make someone yonder, or you know, uh, cash flow, uh, earnings, share, all these things that were not there in the other data sets that, um, that models were typically trained on, on the squad data sets for question and answering from Stanford. We built specialized data sets from my domain knowledge in finance. So whether it's medicine, whether it's health, these are the things we need to do more and more, working with domain experts. And in cybersecurity, MIT found that when you apply deep learning, combining cybersecurity experts with a deep learning model, they were hitting expert, uh, huge 20, 30% performance increases over, over other machine learning techniques. With 5G and autonomous driving, will different eventual providers, Tesla, Uber, etc., communicate data with each other for the networked intelligence to work? That's a great question. I think that's where we have to go to make things work, collaborative learning. Now, under the Obama administration, President Obama administration, there was work actually to put forward in the U.S., standardize, uh, uh, adopt standards across the, uh, the manufacturing, the car sector. Then under President Trump, that got removed or uh, kind of uh, stopped, if you like. But the car industry, if I remember correctly, decided even without the US government at the time pushing for that, they would still try to collaborate with each other without the federal government to try and keep standards in place, common standards, because you are going to have to have, what, as you pointed out, whether you're a VW Audi or BMW or a Ford or a, whoever it is, or BMW or Toyota, engaging with machine-to-machine -machine communication and understanding each other, cooperating, collaborating. So standards are going to have to be there. Otherwise, <laughs> autonomous driving is going to end in a mess. Because you want your car to know your two autonomous cars. I'm about to, the car in front, uh, car, I want to accelerate or overtake you. Or I'm, the car in front, I'm going to brake and turn left or turn right at the next junction. Or there's something coming up in front of me. I've detected something I'm going to brake. I, and I, I want to tell you that even before, as my brake light's coming on, even transmit to you, warning, something's happening in front of me. Or, you know, you know, it might be car five in front and you're in a line. It's out of your sight, out of your line of sight, but it's communicating through 5G, broadcasting to everyone. I'm having to stop an emergency stop in front because something's happened, an accident or whatever, transmitting to everyone behind so that you can minimize that scope for an accident. So absolutely, we need these common standards to enable that.